agenda in that first episode of the series is give people a reason to root for Johnny too. What's going on, everybody? Welcome. This is Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, also known as WMAR, episode 514 with today's guest, Mr. John Hurwitz. Who am I? I'm Jeremy Lesniak. I'm the Whistlekick founder. I'm the show host. I'm a guy who loves to train. I love traditional martial arts. And that's why everything we're doing here is in support of the traditional martial arts. Because I started the company. Makes sense, doesn't it? Hope so. (laughs) If you want to learn more about what we're doing over here to that end, go to whistlekick.com. That's where you'll find everything we're doing. We're involved in a bunch of stuff. And one of the things we're involved in is making stuff. We make a whole bunch of different things. And if you check out the store at whistlekick.com, make sure you use the code podcast15 to save 15%. Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio gets its own website. Nice and easy. Whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. The show comes out twice a week with the goal of connecting, educating, and entertaining traditional martial artists worldwide. If you want to support the work we do, you got some options. Make a purchase. Share an episode. Follow us on social media. Tell a friend. Pick up a book. Leave a review or support us on Patreon. P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash Whistlekick. That's the place to go. It's a place where we post exclusive content only for the supporters. And for as little as $2 a month, you get access to stuff. Most people contribute $5 or $10, and they get access to exclusive podcast episodes. If you like this show, you'll probably like what we do. If you know this show, you know a bit about me. And if you know a bit about me, you know how important I think the Karate Kid film was, not only for me but for the martial arts overall. Today, we have someone who is involved in that. I'm not going to tell you anymore. You might recognize the name. Maybe you press pause and you go to IMDb and you figure out who this person is. That's fine. But if you want to let it unfold a little more organically, just keep listening and you'll understand why I had Mr. John Hurwitz on the show and why it was so important and just regardless, what a great conversation it was. Had a good time. So here we go. So how are you? What's going on? Um, you know, I'm okay. That's the same as pretty much everyone else in the yeah. world. You know, it's a weird have, time to live in, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. Uh, a lot of uh, a lot of frustrations, but a lot of uh, you know, getting some quality family time, which mm. I'm enjoying because I'm usually. Uh, you know, at work or out of town for work. And uh, sure. so I'm, I'm enjoying that element of it. But uh, otherwise, uh, it'd be nice to have everything full speed ahead for everybody. Yeah, yeah, no doubt. What's family look like for you? Uh, I have a wife and uh, two daughters, uh, a, a almost 10-year-old and a seven-year-old. And, you know, we live out here in Los Angeles. So uh, doing a lot of the homeschool thing at this point. Sure. sure. Has that been a big shift for you? The homeschool, it seems some parents, it seems pretty split down the middle from the people I've spoken with. It's either they're embracing it and enjoying being more involved in their child's education, or they're saying, man, I can't wait till I can give this back. Uh, you know, it's it's a combination. I would just say, you know, uh, my daughters uh, are in a, in a school that we really like a lot. And uh, there's a lot of, you know, interactive learning there and teamwork and that kind of stuff. And um, it's a lot harder to do that kind of stuff on Zoom. Um, so, you know, we, uh, I definitely, for their sake, uh, would love for them to be, you know, back at school and getting the full experience and, you know, socializing and all that. But, uh, you know, at the same time, it's, it's nice to kind of be in the mix with their learning, maybe a little bit more so than, than we typically are. Sure. It's funny, your words almost mimic what most people are saying about martial arts training via Zoom right now. Yeah, I would, I would imagine, <laughs> I would imagine it's not exactly the same. It's not, it's not, but you know, what would this have looked like 10 years ago, even five years ago would have been. I mean, yeah, exactly. I mean, you're right. Even five years ago, it would have been much, much more challenging. It's interesting to see the way people adapt as uh, your challenges are thrown at them. And, uh, you know, I feel like many are rising to the occasion and, and, uh, you know, learning a different way of life for, you know, a period of time. And I'm sure there will be elements of this that we bring with us, you know, after we're behind this whole, uh, 
this whole pandemic. Mm, sure, sure. Well, um, I mean, if you're okay, let's let's just keep rolling. Uh, yeah, let's get into it. Okay, cool. Sounds great. Cool. Uh, you know, sometimes we'll do a, a more formal intro, but you know, you're, you're certainly ha- having no trouble conversing, and the tech side of it seems like it's good. So let's uh, let's just keep going. Yeah. Now. We invited you because of a, a pretty specific reason, and typically we'll we'll hold off on on getting into those reasons. But I I kind of want to bring this up early because I've got a feeling that it opens up a lot of doors for the different things that we can talk about, and that is Cobra Kai. Uh-huh. <laughs> well, it's certainly not for my karate prowess because uh, <laughs> there is absolutely none. But uh, yes, Cobra Kai and. Uh, you know, the love of the karate kid. Yeah. Well, I'm sure you've answered the same sort of questions from a, a lot of people over the course of your interviews. And one of the things I take a lot of pride in is trying to be a different style and a different type of interviewer. So rather than, you know, how did you get the inspiration to do Cobra Kai and yada yada and the stuff that I'm sure any of the audience could go and, and research and find the answers to, I'd kind of like to ask you some different stuff. And and the first thing I want to ask you about is what did the Karate Kid represent for you? And and you've probably answered this, but let's start here. What did the Karate Kid represent for you prior to anything with Cobra Kai? You know, several things. I would say that, you know, from a personal experience, you know, it was one of the first movies I ever saw in a movie theater. And it had, it showed in a lot of ways, you know, how impactful um, entertainment can be. Um, You know, for me as a viewer, it was that underdog story. It was, you know, I was from New Jersey. Daniel LaRusso was from New Jersey. So like that, you know, kid going to a new school in in a foreign land all the way across the country in California and, uh, you know, dealing with struggles and overcoming bullies and all that, you know, the, the stories that a lot of people have, but from a, an entertainment standpoint and from a, you know, eventual, you know, desire to be in this business standpoint, you know, I, I think often about that moment in Karate Kid when you realize that Mr. Miyagi was teaching Daniel karate this whole time, that, you know, all those chores had a reason. Um, and that being one of those mind blowing moments in a movie that, you know, I was, you know, six or seven years old seeing this and, you know, not, I didn't see that coming in any sort of way. And, and the way that you can be watching something and be surprised like that. And, um, that was a big moment for me just in terms of, from an entertainment standpoint, and then just sort of the themes of the movie, the father son stuff, the, the bullying story, the underdog stories, uh, you know, I've, in my career, I've often done, done underdog stories and I've, I've always been a fan of the underdog and Karate Kid uh, definitely started that. Did you identify as an underdog as a kid? I think so. Yeah. You know, I definitely, uh, I definitely did. You know, I, uh, when I was, you know, about, I think it was about seven years old, I moved uh, from New Jersey to Pittsburgh and I lived there for seven years. So I was a new kid in a new town. It's a tough um, town. Uh, well, I wasn't in the I wasn't in the city. Okay. I was in a, I was in a nice uh, a suburb outside of the city. But you know, I was uh, it was a a, a town that uh, you know uh, the you know I I it's weird. You know, in we we always joke around in uh, in the Cobra Kai writers room about how Daniel Russo, this like Italian kid from New Jersey, was kind of like a, min- a minority character moving to. California where everyone was blonde and it was sort of like Daniel was this underdog because he wasn't like the California boy in a certain way and um, in in a weird similar way you know for me moving to the particular town that I lived in in Pittsburgh um, uh, you know feeling a little bit like an outsider and feeling like I was you know different than the other kids from there because most of them were all from there uh, I think that instills a little bit of an underdog nature. Um, and, you know, I had parents who were underdogs, uh, so they brought the underdog spirit. Both my parents, you know, grew up in, in the Bronx in, in New York, and my mom grew up in the projects. My dad grew up in something that was worse than the projects, um, and they were kind of their own sort of success story. 
Uh, so there was a lot of that spirit was sort of, um, you know, present in my life, uh, in my childhood. Uh, so I think I, I always connected to those kinds of characters. This is the point in the conversation where the guests will usually say, and that's when I found martial arts, or that's when my, when my <laughs> parents put me into martial arts. But if I, if I understood what you said earlier correctly, that's not what happened no. for you. So what? My, my parents, my, my parents would never put me in martial arts. My parents, oh, uh, never. You know, it was, okay. That's strong. Yeah. Why? Yeah. It was it, because it was, uh, you know, uh, there was a lot of focus st strictly on academics in my house and sports and, uh, were not like at the forefront. I think it became clear, um, you know, in, in my household, it was all about sort of like, you know, doing well in school, getting into a good college. And I think martial arts is something that can be very helpful in, in many ways in life. And I wish that I had learned martial arts, but it was sort of, there was a singular focus sort of in, in my household about like, okay, you're a, a really smart kid. Let's lean into that and make sure that you're doing all the kinds of things that are going to lead you to get into a good college, which will lead you to, you know, being able to take care of yourself as an adult. So I think there was always sort of that, um, pressure from a very, just a very simple, like, okay, being able to get a job standpoint. Um, as I've gotten older, I've learned, you know, the value of like being a, a member of a sports team or, or with martial arts, sort of all the, the mental side of it beyond, you know, just learning to defend yourself. Um, those are all things that are very valuable for people of all ages. Um, it just was, you know, the physical activity, um, <laughs> Uh, I wasn't signed up for a lot of sports as a kid until I sought them out as I got older. Um, you know, my dad played basketball, so we had a basketball hoop and, you know, I would hit a ball in the backyard and stuff like that, but I wasn't like signed, signed up for organized sports very much. It wasn't a big thing in my family. Was it all academics then, or did you have something? Did you have some extracurricular, some place yeah. that you could use as a, an outlet? Yeah, well, I did, you know, I did get into basketball, uh, so that I did have that you know, uh, that in, in the sports, uh, side of things, but I was, I was, I had creative outlets, you know, I was, a, as a kid, I, you know, I loved garbage pail kids. So I made my own version of garbage pail kids. Like I, you know, I always had like little creative endeavors and that kind of thing. And then when I was in high school, I was, I joined the debate team. Um, that was like, cause I was a, somebody who liked sports and I was, you know, a competitive person, but, I, you know, wasn't somebody who at that stage when you're in high school and you want to join sports teams, people have been doing it for many, many years um, in their childhood. So I was a little late to the game, but debate was something. And that's actually where Hayden Schlossberg and I became good friends. We both joined the debate team the same year. Oh, and that's nice. how, how our friendship came. And then, you know, I was, you know, the, in student council, I was the president of my high school. Um, so I was, I was involved in like, you know, I was on the math team. I was in math league. Um, so, you know, I, uh, I did plenty of extracurriculars, but they were not, uh, they were with the exception of basketball, um, you know, which was, I was on in the rec league. I wasn't even on the school team. Um, it was, you know, mostly, uh, things that you're using your, your mind as opposed to your body. I can relate to this resume that you're putting out there, debate, math team. I had martial arts and, you know, I, I was on the soccer team, but, you know, not in any kind of, uh, pivotal way. Nobody was, was ever saying, oh man, you know, wish Jeremy wasn't at that tournament this weekend. We can mm -hmm. really use him on the soccer field. <laughs> yeah. 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 But, I, but, you know, we've got two examples now and, and, and if anyone's done debate, they might even agree with me in, in putting a third here. It sounds like this creative approach of putting your own stamp on something that's already out there. You know, is, is that a common theme for you, Gar you know, making your own version of Garbage Pail Kids? And anybody who's probably under, what, 37 <laughs> might not know what we're talking about here. And, and um, I'll, I'll let you explain Garbage Pail Kids for yeah. the benefit of the audience. Yeah. yeah, Garbage Pail Kids were kind of, you know, you know, baseball cards. Uh, Garbage Pail Kids were sort of like a comedic uh, set of cards, which had, it was kind of a play on Cabbage Patch Kids, which were these dolls back in the day. I think they still have them now. But it was like the messed up version of, you know, the Couch Patch Kids. So each card had like, you know, uh, something kind of gross about the character or like a horror spin. Or there was always some like little comedic bent to uh, 
these characters and you would collect them. And yeah, so I made my own and they were called gag gang kids and they were, you know, the, the same exact kind of thing, but just sort of doing my own version of it. Um, but yeah, I would say, um, you know, uh, it's definitely, it, it, maybe there is some theme to that in, in my career. Like I'm a fan of something and then I like to kind of, um, you know, find my own art in it as well. What were your thoughts on the subsequent Karate Kid films? Because I, I'm, I'm just trusting my gut here that there's, there's something there that led to Cobra Kai. Well, you know, it's, you know, so the first one, absolutely loved it. The second one, I absolutely loved as well. But, you know, uh, you know, at the very beginning of the second movie, you see kind of what happened after the tournament. And you see, you know, Johnny Lawrence uh, getting kind of strangled by Sensei Kreese and the dysfunction that you're seeing kind of going on there. Um, you know, did have a big impact on sort of uh, making Cobra Kai eventually. Uh, you know, it, it, it was a moment which, which, you know, made you think a little bit more about what's going on on that side of things, what's going on in Johnny's life. And it was sort of like a combination of that combined with just sort of, you know, life in general, being somebody um, who, you know, when I was in high school, I had, you know, I... I Definitely had friends of all kinds, but, you know, you have your bullies. I think everyone has their own bullies in life. And then, you know, uh, you know, I remember being, you know, graduating college and living in L.A. with uh, Hayden. And we were already writing out here. And Josh Heald, who was one of my best friends from college, he moved out soon after. And we would hang out all the time. And, you know, you had some years since high school. And then you start to, like, look back and you're like, you talked about the bullies from high school. And you recognize, wow, that kid like had a rough time in his home life or, you know, what was going on there? Why was that kid that way? And you start thinking of those things and uh, it, you know, led to, uh, you know, thinking about the character of Johnny Lawrence in a different kind of way. I was like, well, we, in, it was not just Karate Kid, like B Billy Zapka, as you probably know, played a bully character in like four or five movies in the eighties. And, you know, I was a huge fan of the movie Just One of the Guys. Hayden and I, like when we were in high school, we talked about that movie all the time. And Billy's like a hilarious bully in that. And, you know, I, w I always had this fascination with, with Zabka as a result of those movies. And back then we nicknamed him 80s. Outside. And we would, you know, we'd talk about Zabka a lot. <laughs> and, uh, and this was dating back to high school. And then, you know, it was viewing him as this bully in this sort of a comedic way. And then years later now reflecting on it as, okay, this is somebody who, you know, there's more there to that character. So yeah, for, it's been, you know, almost 20 years that the guys and I have talked about, like, wouldn't it be cool to do a movie called Cobra Kai where you're like seeing Johnny, Johnny's side of things and like what happens to that bully in high school. And you know, uh, it had a big impact, but you know, when looking at, you know, Karate Kid, Three, Karate Kid 2, like, you know, Daniel's story, uh, going to Okinawa, all that stuff was, uh, you know, we connected with. And then even Karate Kid 3 um, for, you know, there's, you know, some ridiculousness in that movie, but you get to see deeper into the kind of Cobra Kai side of the world where Daniel Russo is even brought into Cobra Kai and you learn more about Kreese's backstory and Terry Silver and all that stuff. These are all things that, you know, when we were thinking about the idea of, you know, not, not just not doing Karate Kid or Cobra Kai as a movie, but, you know, pursuing it as a TV show that, you know, would hopefully have many seasons. Um, we just thought there was so much there and there's so much fun to kind of play around with what was there, um, fill in the gaps. Um, and then even for things, you know, parts of that franchise that maybe, you know, were a little ridiculous or, um, uh, that, you know, weren't as respected. We love, we love leaning into the stuff that isn't respected and find a way to make it respected, find a way to, um, ground characters or ground situations that like just seem, you know, uh, unrealistic or bizarre we, in our minds, those things happened in this world. Those are real things. So like when we're, when we're approaching it though, through our lens, it's trying to make sense of, okay, why is this character, why did that character behave that way? Um, so. Mm -hmm. There's a pop culture occurrence in the TV show, How I Met Your Mother. And I'm assuming you know where I'm going and, and some of the listeners are going to know where I'm going because I've brought this up before, this, this idea that one of the main characters in that sitcom 
played by Neil Patrick Harris, decided and and even brought up one day on on an episode that the Karate Kid, the story, it, it's really it's about Johnny, and he created this polarization that they actually carried through, and it ends up in the final season, I believe, even in the final episode, and Billy Zabka makes some appearances in mm-hmm. the show, which was just an absolute riot, and it led to from what I could see at that point, more and more people becoming, you know, Cobra Kai fans. And this idea that maybe, maybe Daniel was the villain. And it created this, this, this external conflict that I don't know if that catalyzed anything in creating the show, or if you just embraced it, maybe it was just, you know, the planets aligned. It's, I, it's really, it's really funny because, um, you know, like I said, like we've been talking about this since before How I Met Your Mother even existed, since before I had ever made a movie, since before we made Harold and Kumar go to White Castle, which had Neil Patrick Harris kind of come back in that movie, which kind of led to his casting in How I Met Your Mother. Yeah. And right. then his character is now like uh, talking about Johnny Lawrence and the Karate Kid in this way that we've been talking about it for a decade. So it was bizarre, um, but the way I look at it with that, because there was that, there was also a really great YouTube video where Daniel LaRusso is the real villain, kind of, or the real bully. Um, I just think it's one of those things that, like, you know, the Karate Kid is such a huge um, touchstone in the lives of many people all over the world. And, you know, uh, when there's that many people who love something, and that many people analyzing something or, you know, back then there was less entertainment. So like a movie like that, you're watching over and over and over again, over the years, it's ingrained in your life in a major way. And you think about it in all sorts of different ways. So it's not surprising that like, that many people across, uh, across the world and not, and many people in entertainment would have examined that movie and thought about it in a different kind of way. And, and, like, like I said, like for us, even back in, in high school, just we were, we, there was something, you know, hilarious about like this teenage karate gang <laughs> that like is terrorizing a high school. Like most high schools have like, you know, Ooh, there's the football team or there, there's like the, the, the sort of stereotypical kind of like, you know, jocks in your school. But like in the world, of the karate kid, there's this karate gang that is bullying people. And like, that just felt like such a, specific thing that's going on and with the character like barney who has a certain way of life and a mentality like it made sense that he would look at the karate kid in that particular way where you know johnny is the is the true karate kid and it definitely had a a a big impact out in the world i'll be honest like i watched how i met your mother for many seasons and by the time they got to that stuff i had stopped watching the show i was busy i was busy with other stuff It, it was no knock on the show it wasn't like i stopped liking it um so i never saw those episodes until after we had like uh even pitched Cobra Kai. I knew about it I, because we were planning to do the show, but I had never seen um, that stuff. Uh, but like, it's, uh, it was, it's funny the way, um, you know, things kind of go full circle because, um, you know, uh, it, it's, you know, for, for me in my career, when I look, when I made the Harold and Kumar movies, like we had Karate Kid references in like all the movies that we did. And, uh, you know, we actually tried to get Billy Zabka in Harold and Kumar Escape from Guantanamo Bay, which we shot in 2007. Uh, we had written a scene where where Billy would play basically, um, he'd be playing like a, like John, he played Johnny Lawrence basically. And then Harold had this nightmare sequence where he was trying to get to his love interest, Maria. And we had this thing where Billy Zabka as Johnny Lawrence basically steals his girl from him. And it was sort of, uh, you know, playing upon like he's the bully in the mind of those characters. Um, and Billy at the time, we didn't know him. Um, we reached out through reps. Uh, we got a nice, nice, you know, thanks, but no thanks. I, I appreciate you thinking of me, but I'm not looking to sort of, you know, put on the gi and do kind of like a uh, anything that's sort of like Karate Kid related at this time in my career. And then, you know, a few years passed, three or four years, then Josh Heald makes Hot Tub Time Machine and casts Billy in that. 
And we end up going to set and we meet Billy there. And Billy's like, the reason I'm here right now is because I regretted not doing Harold and Kumar. Uh, <laughs> so like we got to know, we got to know uh, Billy. Um, uh, the three of us all got to know Billy through Josh's experience working with him on Hot Tub and um, just sort of knowing him and knowing kind of his perspective on uh, that character, uh, you know, played a big role in Cobra Kai. I, I've said this story before that when we were like, you know, 23, 24 years old, we bought like the new Karate Kid special edition DVD. And the three of us were like, you know, like I said, in our early 20s living in LA and we watched all the special features on that. And that was the first time where I saw uh, an interview with Billy Zapko where he was saying in his mind, he didn't view himself as the villain, as the villain in that movie. He viewed himself as just another kid in the high school who had his own desires and his own dreams. And he maybe was a degenerate in the past, but he was saying at the beginning of the movie, I'm an ex-degenerate. I'm going to turn over a new leaf. He was going to try to mend fences with his girlfriend, Allie, and, and get back together with her, this girl that he loved. And then this new kid came to town and, and got in the way of all that. And in his mind, you know, this kid sort of ruined his plans and they just had conflict. It wasn't like one was the bully and one was the good kid. In his mind, they were just two kids who had their own stories. And hearing Billy talk about that, you know, all those years ago added another layer in the minds of Hayden, Josh and I, when we thought about Karate Kid and eventually Cobra Kai. And anyone who's seen Cobra Kai knows that you didn't just flop to the other direction. Instead of saying, you know, Daniel had his moment in the sun, his time to be the hero. Let's make Johnny the hero. It's much more balanced. And I'm curious what led to that. I think that it was, our, our thought was, we always loved Daniel LaRusso also. And I, we thought that there's, uh, there's something interesting in storytelling, especially in, in television where you are with characters, ideally for seasons at a time that, you know, the world isn't black and white. Like, you know, it, it's funny because people at first when we were selling the show, because Hayden, Josh and I, we all come from the world of comedy. Everyone was like, well, is this a comedy? We're like, well, yes and no. It's a comedy, but it's also a drama. And it's also an action piece. And it's all, it's all different sorts of things. And very much the way, you know, television these days, I think is, can be excellent in the sense that you don't have to be, you know, pigeonholed as one thing because life isn't one thing. Sometimes in life there's tragedy. Sometimes in life there's comedy. You know, you have a wide range of emotions and the same thing can be said for characters. When you look at, you know, Johnny Lawrence and Daniel LaRusso, like we already know that there's reasons to root for Daniel LaRusso. Like we shouldn't make it where like he's just suddenly not the guy that we knew. The guy that we knew was worth rooting for. Um, the guy that we knew of Johnny was le uh, less obvious to root for. So our agenda in that first episode of the series is give people a reason to root for Johnny too. And the, the effect of that is, you know, Daniel Russo in his eyes is the villain. So there's, there are certain people who watch the show who are just, just, who are just like, you know, I'm team Johnny and, you know, screw Daniel and, and have that kind of mentality. But when writing the show, we view them both as protagonists. Both of them are people, frankly, many characters on our show are the protagonists. Now, that doesn't mean that they're not the antagonist to another character on the show or that, um, you know, that they do things that are wrong or they make mistakes, but that's the way, you know, people are. And I think they're just, uh, we wanted to make sure that, you know, that you see uh, the good in both and the bad in both. Of course, this is a martial arts show, and so we tend to talk about martial arts with martial artists. And so I want to talk about the martial arts in the show. One of the things that has struck me is that it is the, the choreography is very simple, but very it's, it's very spot on. I've trained in a lot of different martial arts schools, and you know people are, are they're not very good, <laughs> and mm -hmm. they're doing these techniques, and they're, they're finding their way through it. And I'm sure. I'm not the only one who watches as, as an instructor and, and feels both the frustration of watching people try to find how to do these movements with their body, but also some acknowledgement, some familiarity. And I'm guessing that too was something that was important for you. It was, it was, you know, even though Hayden, Josh and I are not martial artists, um, you know, we knew we we're doing a show um, about martial arts and about, um, and, and you want, 
people like you to watch the show and see an authenticity and um, enjoy it on those levels as well. And it all comes down to our, our, uh, our fight choreographer and stunt choreographers. It's first, we started off with Hiro Koda, who is a legend in the business has done tons of uh, film and television over the years. Um, he was trained by his father um, and Karate Kid was a hugely important film in his childhood. Um, so for him to come on to the show, it was a dream come true to be, you know, uh, able to uh, choreograph fight scenes from the perspective of Miyagi-Do karate and Cobra Kai karate and, and what makes them different and, and uh, you know, giving each character their own unique flourishes that make sense given their personalities and all that. And, you know, starting season two, um, it was Hiro and his wife, Janelle Kerfman, who is also a fantastic uh, stunt performer and now stunt, uh, uh, stunt uh, coordinator. Uh, the two of them, uh, we have so much martial arts on our show and there's so much going on at, at, at all times and uh, the schedule is tight. So both of them are leading the charge and they have just an amazing team of, of, um, of martial artists who uh, are well-trained and they know everybody in, in the field. And they put a lot of thought and energy into making sure that these fights are authentic and that, the, that everything looks really good. You know, Hayden, Josh and I, we write the stories. We know, um, uh, you know, we, we, we're telling the story sometimes through martial arts. And we'll write in the script sort of the kind of uh, shape of a fight scene. Um, but it's really Hiro and Janelle who uh, make each one unique and cool and work with these actors. The thing that's amazing is, you know, on our show, very few people actually knew martial arts coming in. I mean, uh, Billy did, but it had been a while since he had been in the dojo. But, um, you know, pretty much everybody else, you know, is is learning from scratch and I think, and most of what you see on camera uh, are the actors. I mean, we have an amazing stunt team and we, you know, we'll cut to uh, shots of stunt performers when we have to, but uh, it's a testament to the hard work that the actors put in and that Hiro and Janelle and that team put in to make it look as, as strong as it does. Within the world of martial arts, there are a handful of movies, I would say really three that martial arts instructors can point at and say, this movie had a significant impact on enrollment and thus generationally responsible for martial arts growth, if not growth maintenance, depending on how you look at it. And Karate Kid, of course, is one of those films. Anyone who had a school in the early 80s knows that Karate Kid led to students, if, assuming that you taught children. There's a responsibility there then to the martial arts, I guess, community. And, and though you're not immersed in it yourself, it, it, it really sounds to me like you're much more sensitive to it than, than most people would be not being a martial arts practitioner. How often do the three of you talk about martial arts outside of the show and how, I guess, martial arts maybe has changed or... I think you know where I'm going with this. I might not be using the right words to pose the question. Um, you know, we'll talk about it. It's, we talk about it mostly in the writer's room. Um, you know, uh, it, it's, you know, uh, I think we're, we're drawn to the philosophies. Um, and we think, we talk a lot about the, there's the Miyagi-Do sort of philosophies and the Cobra Kai philosophies uh, on our show. And, you know, I think that, what we'll talk a lot about is that there's value in both sides um, in terms of the mentality. The, you know, there are people who need to be more aggressive in life for the, uh, to, to get where they need to be. That, um, so, you know, uh, the Cobra Kai, some of the Cobra Kai philosophies are valuable for them. And then there's people who need a little bit more peace and thought um, and balance in their lives. Um, that could really use the Miyagi-Do philosophy. So we'll talk about that, those elements um, in terms of, you know, just uh, approach to life um, and how uh, 
there's a lot of value in all that. In terms of, you know, the specifics in martial arts, we'll talk about how it's used in entertainment, um, you know, from it feeling, from it being real to, you know, uh, uh, different uh, film techniques that, you know, take it to, to uh, levels that are not realistic and all that kind of stuff. Um, but, uh, you know, we, uh, we our, our whole thing is really uh, starting with the, the mental side of all of it and then, you know, uh, working with Hito and Janelle on the physical side. Martial arts on TV is, is kind, of a, kind of a tough industry. You know, Into the Badlands did its best, unfortunately got canned, uh, depending on how you view Iron Fist. You know, that and the rest of the Defenders shows were pulled from Netflix. Mm -hmm. And that kind of leaves you guys until at least uh, the Walker Texas Ranger reboot. Mm -hmm. Does does that pressure within the industry? Do you feel that? Or do you consider Cobra Kai to be different enough to that it's forging its own path? Uh, You know, I think we view it forging its own path. I mean, we think that we have a show that um, is a lot of things at once and martial arts are a component of it. But, you know, I, what I, what, what's so great about the karate kid is you don't have to be a martial artist to love karate kid, to get, um, to get, uh, emotionally what that movie is throwing down and to be invested in sort of the sports component of that final tournament. Um, you know, uh, we view it as a, it's a sports TV show. It's a coming of age TV show. It's a, a, sh- a, a, in a, in an honest and unique way that only people who, you know, existed in the Karate Kid film can, can, uh, th- their experience is specific, but, you know, there's universal themes for those characters of those ages. And then we have the teenage characters and, um, you know, all that, uh, all the kinds of, uh, challenges that just young people go through in a modern time. So, you know, we're using these, these dojos as a way to, um, uh, take a look at, you know, other issues that people have in their lives. And like I said before, you know, a lot of it is thinking about, you know, philosophies of life. And, you know, the, uh, the actual fighting is uh, just, just a portion of it. But, you know, in terms of a feeling of responsibility or pressure, I think we, we, we only feel, you know, responsibility of, you know, telling an honest story that, you know, people are going to connect with. And when it comes to things like the authenticity of martial arts, those are things that are important to us. So we make sure to surround ourselves with, uh, with people who uh, are going to make sure that, um, you know, we're, we're doing justice for uh, that segment of the audience. As beloved as the Karate Kid is among martial artists, there's a person that was involved in Karate Kid who may be even more beloved, and that's Fumio Demura. And I'm wondering if there's been any conversation that you're able to talk about, any attempted involvement. Uh, I, I would, I would, I'm sure I would catch a lot of flack if I didn't pose this question. So. You know, uh, to be honest, no, you know, we are, are, you know, when, when reaching back to people involved in the franchise, you know, it's, uh, you know, Robert Mark Kamen, who is the initial writer of the Karate Kid and, you know, his, the Karate Kid is his story. You know, he was, uh, you know, a kid in, in New York city, you know, bullied young guy who learned martial arts and had a, a, a close relationship with his sensei. Um, so when we're, when we're leaning on the past, um, where, uh, you know, speaking with him, you know, there's Patty Johnson, who, uh, is obviously a legend in the martial arts, um, community who, uh, was the, uh, stunt coordinator on, in the original film. And he's actually the, uh, the referee in the, uh, you know, big match. That final fight. Yeah. In that final fight. Um, I've, I've actually never spoken with him, but I know that Marty Cove and uh, Billy Zapka are still in touch with him. Um, but uh, no, this, that, that, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, people from, from the, the past uh, Karate Kid, those are, those are the people that, you know, uh, 
we've leaned on. And so what's coming? You know, this is the point in the conversation where I'll, I'll usually ask the guest, you know, here we've talked about what was and what is and, and what's coming. Now, of course, that conversation is a little bit different with you as we're talking about Cobra Kai, but I'd, I'd like to talk not just about Cobra Kai, but about you because you're spearheading this. You, who you are contributes to what the show is. And without you, the show doesn't exist, right? And even if we can make an argument for, for shoehorning somebody else into your role, the show becomes different. So if we can, if you're willing to give us some insight into you, if not Cobra Kai, you know, maybe that, that satisfies some of the listeners for what we might be sure. able to expect. Sure. You know, with, with Cobra Kai, we're eager for people to see season three. Uh, season three is ready to go. Um, it's, it's in the can and it's, uh, it takes things to a whole new level. You know, anyone who's watched the first two seasons of the show knows that uh, a lot of big stuff happened in the season two finale. And, uh, you know, a lot of characters are at low points. And, um, but season three, uh, you know, we talk about sort of looking to your past to find your future is sort of a big theme uh, in the season. So without giving too much away, um, that's a, a big theme. And you'll see Daniel Rousseau does return to Okinawa in season three. Uh, and I think that's uh, something that a lot of fans are looking forward to. Um, but uh, it's, uh, you know, we will, we will, you know, uh, I'm not sure if this is, uh, when this is airing exactly. Um, but, uh, you know, we, uh, we're a few weeks away probably from uh, the world kind of learning uh, more about the release plan for season three, but eager on that. And, you know, as for me, uh, you know, Hayden, Josh and I, um, you know, Hayden and I have worked in our careers together uh, since the beginning. You know, we were friends in high school. We both went to college for separate things. And in the middle of college, uh, decided to write a screenplay together and try to sell that and try to pursue a Hollywood career as opposed to the other things we were pursuing in life. And we were lucky enough to make that happen. And Josh, uh, who I, I've said was a close friend of mine in, in college, he moved out afterwards to pursue the same things. And, you know, we've worked separately through our careers, uh, Hayden and I, and then Josh separate. Uh, but Karate Kid, uh, you know, uh, our passion for the Karate Kid and making Cobra Kai brought the three of us together. And now the three of us have a company together called Counterbalance Entertainment. Um, and counterbalance is actually the name of the fifth episode of season one of Cobra Kai. Um, and, uh, uh, now the three of us have a company together where we're developing other TV shows, uh, some that we're the main writers on and others that are projects that we can be, uh, you know, helping other writers along, uh, with their own, uh, you know, passion projects. Um, but, you know, the, uh, as, as I go forward, I think the goal is to uh, just be productive and make several TV, you know, have several TV shows on the air and have movies going at the same time. And, you know, when this uh, before this whole pandemic thing, uh, you know, came down, we were on the verge of being on a movie set for a movie we were producing. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, we were working on a writer's room for another TV show called Obliterated. Uh, and, um, uh, you know, everything's been on hold, like, uh, like everyone else's life out there, uh, things are on hold, but we're, uh, you know, using this time to, uh, ca to continue being productive and, uh, can't wait to get back on set and get back out there and, uh, you know, provide more entertainment for, uh, for everyone to watch. Do you think you'll ever explore that movie idea again? Was, was the movie, was the Karate Kid movie? Cobra Kai movie, I guess, that you set aside? You think you'll well, pick the that Cobra, back up? The, no, the Cobra Kai movie became this, became this TV show. Sure. And, I, and, and we're better off for this version of it. Okay. Um, I, think, I think a thing, you know, it's funny, Hayden and I um, made uh, uh, the movie American Reunion, which was the American Pie reunion movie. Uh, so that was another example of something that Hayden and I were fans of the movie American Pie. We were in college when that came out. Uh, it was uh, it was up our alley, and uh, we got the opportunity to do their reunion movie. And 
you know, what we found when making a 90 minute movie that especially a movie like that, that had such a large cast, um, there was always a desire to like, you know, have that next generation of characters on in that movie and, and be able to sort of dig deep with them. But there was no, there's not, there's no real estate for that in a 90 minute story. Um, in, in, if we were doing Cobra Kai as a movie, um, I fear that we would have had to do a more black and white version where Johnny is the hero and Daniel is mm. the villain without being able to kind of explore both sides. I'm not sure. And certainly wouldn't have, uh, the room to explore a, a wide array of different kinds of kids um, in that in that kind of a movie. Maybe you'd have a Miguel character, but you wouldn't have all the rest of the kids. Um, so, you know, when making the Cobra Kai TV show, we've been able to uh, do the things that we wanted to do in that movie, but do so much more. Makes sense. Yeah, it's it's. Utterly magic. I remember watching the first season and, and telling everyone I could, it's perfect. Huh. And granted, I'm as close to the the ideal demographic as you get. You know, I'm I'm, I'm 40. I grew up with the movie. Started martial arts when I was young. Definitely bullied, and I can identify with so much in that in that show. And just it it really struck a chord for me. So. Personally, I want to thank you and, and my thank yous to the rest of your team because it's something really special that you've put together. And we've talked about it on the show quite a bit because it's so special. Well, I, uh, you know, uh, very much appreciate it. It's something that is special to all of us. Um, you know, it's, it's funny. Uh, I was thinking about this the other day that, you know, we're, we're blessed and, and lucky that we get to be the people who are continuing the Karate Kid story uh, that we get to work with the characters, Daniel and Johnny and even Mr. Miyagi, um, you know, Sensei Kreese, these characters that had such a big impact in our lives and the lives of people all over the world. But we view ourselves as just, you know, uh, part of a larger community that loved the Karate Kid who are, who carry the lessons of the movie or just the, uh, the movie itself forward in their own unique ways, whether you're a martial artist, uh, you know, you're training other students because you were inspired by Karate Kid in that way to um, people who do fan art, not just from Cobra Kai, but for Karate Kid. And you see like, a be like just a few weeks ago, I saw like a beautiful painting of, of Mr. Miyagi. Um, you know, Cobra Kai is our contribution um, in this community of people who were impacted by uh, that film, you know, 30 some odd years ago and to people who've continued to be impacted by that film, um, uh, to this day. Uh, and, uh, so, you know, for us, it, uh, making Cobra Kai is making something that we, that we know if we would love it, then we would hope that others would love it as well. And it's been, it's been amazing seeing the reaction, uh, to people, uh, these last few years. Mm -hmm. And one more thing before I let you go, because here on Martial Arts Radio, we're really story driven. And, you know, here the story, we're, we're talking about Cobra Kai. And I'm wondering if you might have a behind the scenes, something that, you know, the world doesn't really know about that you'd be willing to share with us. Could be funny, could be inspiring, whatever that might be. Hmm. It's, it's a, that's a tough question because there's, it's so, uh, there's so many things. <laughs> uh, huh. I mean, I guess, uh, yeah, I'll talk a little bit just about Marty Cove. Uh, you know, uh, it's, it's so funny, these, these characters that you, you watch uh, all these years, you know, uh, Sensei Kreese is, you know, basically Darth Vader. He's the, just pure evil. Um, and, you know, he's somebody that, you know, many of us as children were, were scared of. And it's the opposite of who Marty Cove is as, as a man. He's so much fun. He loves to joke around. He is, uh, you know, he's just got this great sense of humor. And uh, it's fun when there's somebody who has played this icon an iconic character and fully 100% embraces it. Um, it's, uh, you know, the first time... Uh, I, I met Marty, uh, Hayden, Josh, and I had dinner with him. 
at uh, this restaurant in Los Angeles called Dantana's, which is this classic restaurant that's been around for many, many, many years, I think, uh, since the 30s or 40s or something like that. And uh, uh, the first time we we're, were having dinner together, um, I got to, I wanted to have a steak and he wanted to have veal parm. And I kind of wanted veal parm, he kind of wanted steak. So my first time I, I met Marty Cove, we shared a meal. We uh, ordered two dishes. And I ordered uh, the Dabney Coleman steak, and he ordered the Jerry Weintraub, which is the veal parm. And Jerry Weintraub, of course, produced the Karate Kid. Um, so, uh, you know, from that moment on, uh, you know, when, when I got to uh, meet Sensei Kreese and, and share, uh, go halvesies, like, like we're a couple, <laughs> uh, and, and share, uh, share two, two dishes with him, uh, I, I think at that moment, I, my, my life had reached peak, uh, surrealness <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, it's been a blast ever since working with him and Ralph and Billy. I mean, these, these three guys who have lived with the karate kid for all these years, um, uh, could not be more of a pleasure to work with the chemistry between all of them, uh, and just the energy that they bring on set and the warmth that they bring to the new cast. Um, uh, you know, it really does feel like family. And I think when we're on set, I think people feel that. And, you know, it's, uh, it's a pleasure, uh, being part of this group where when you're on set, it's not just the cast on camera, but the crew behind the scenes, people are wearing their, their Cobra Kai gear and their Miyagi-Do gear. I think we're all, we're all in as a group making the show. And, uh, you know, I think it comes from, it, it wouldn't be that way if Ralph, Billy, and Marty weren't the men that they are. That's a great story. Thanks for sharing that. Sure. And as we wind up here, you know, we'll often ask the guest how they want to send this out, but I, I kind of want to corral this a little bit. You know, there are a lot of lessons that you could take from any of the movies, from the show, from the, from that entire universe. But within Cobra Kai, within the two, if you want to look to season three, where, where we haven't gone yet, that's fine. But if you had to pull one lesson out of that and a moment that goes with it that maybe you'd want to leave the audience with as we fade out here, what would that be? You know, I would just say, and this is sort of the approach with um, to the show from the beginning. And you, I think you feel it, uh, in many scenes in the show is just that concept that, uh, everyone has a bully in their life. Um, you don't know where people are coming from. I think that at times, uh, especially these days where, uh, the world is polarized in a lot of ways that, and, you know, things are, are brought down to a tweet or a comment on the internet or, um, you know, people are living in extremes in their head a lot of times and don't look at, um, you know, what's going on in the lives of others or, you know, uh, look at other people's perspectives. And I think that's a, a big theme that you see in Cobra Kai is trying to see both sides of a, of a character and having characters eventually uh, start to understand one another. And I think that um, going forward as a society, I think the more that we can look to find commonality and, uh, you know, rather than have knee jerk reactions of anger or hatred towards others and, and take that step back and try to understand one another, the better off we all are. Like I promised a good conversation about something that's pretty important. And if nothing else, something that I'm very passionate about, Mr. Hurwitz, thank you for your time. Thank you for the work that you have done and are doing. And I hope we can talk again because I am blown away with everything going on with Cobra Kai. If you want to check out the show notes, whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. We've got photos. We've got videos. We've got links, and transcripts, and newsletter signups, and links to guest social media. It's, it's all over there. There's a ton of stuff. Go check it out. And if you're willing to support everything we're doing here, You've got some choices. Go to whistlekick.com, use the code podcast15, gets you 15% off. You can also share an episode, leave a review, tell a friend, or contribute to the Patreon, patreon.com slash whistlekick. We're going to give you free stuff if you do. 
And if you see somebody out in the world wearing a whistlekick shirt, maybe a hat, be sure to say hello. Who knows where that'll go? Our social media, everywhere. It's at whistlekick and my personal email address, jeremy at whistlekick.com. That wraps up another episode. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day.